Forms are an essential part of most web applications. And if you're learning a new framework, it's always nice to know an efficient and flexible way of building them. In React, if you're using native state to handle forms, it can get quite complicated and require a lot of boilerplate. Especially when you start messing with validation. Here is a simple example of what a form with good user experience looks like. The first time you fill it in, no validation is being done. When we submit the form for the first time, if there are validation errors, they are displayed and the first input with validation error automatically becomes active. After the first submit, the input values will get validated in real time on every change we make. And when we click the submit button, it becomes disabled while the form is submitting. You can imagine that coding all this logic every time by ourselves can be very time consuming. Thankfully, there are a lot of libraries that can help abstract all this complexity of working with forms. And there is one library that has been really crushing it, React Hook Form. It has become kind of the standard way of handling forms in React. I mean, just look at the GitHub stars, more than 30k stars probably mean something. The nice thing about this library is that even though it abstracts most of the complexity of handling forms, it still gives us everything we need to customize it for our needs. In this video, we'll go through the basic setup and features of React Hook Form. But that's not all, we'll also create our own custom components that work seamlessly with the library. And to top it off, we'll learn how to integrate with more complex custom components and third-party components as well. Here, as a starting point, we have a form using native input tags. The form values are not connected to anything, so it doesn't actually work at this point. I'm using Tailwind here for the style, but that's not important for this video. You might have noticed that we have repeated styles in each input. We we'll work on that later. For now, let's just ignore it. The first thing we want to do here is define the structure of our form data for validation. React Hook Form is compatible with multiple different schema libraries, but Zod is by far my favorite. And it has also kind of become the default package for working with validation in TypeScript. Another big one out there is the Yup package. Feel free to check both of them to see which one you like the most. For our form schema, first we need to set up the name field. Let's limit it with a minimum of 2 characters and a maximum of 255. Then we have our email field. Good thing we can just add .email and just let Zod take care of the validation for us. For the password, we could use a regular expression with strict rules for better security. But I'm kind of feeling lazy today, so I'll just accept any string greater than 6 characters. And let's limit it to a maximum of 50 characters. Now we need to set up the password confirmation validation. And here's where things start to get a little tricky, because we need a custom validation to check if both fields have the same value. Fortunately, Zod has a refine function that allows us to do just that. But we can't use the refine function in the password confirmation field itself, because then we don't have access to the other fields. To have access to all the fields, we need to use the refine on the root of our schema. We will compare the password with the password confirmation field and if it returns false, that means that we have a validation error. In that case, we want to display the error message telling that the passwords don't match. And we want that error to be for the password confirmation field. That's it, we have our validation schema ready. Now let's set up React hook form with this schema. All we need to do is use the use form hook. And this is a generic hook, which means that we can pass the type of our data to leverage the type safety support for the package. And we haven't created the TypeScript type yet, but here is another great thing about the Zod package. It has a feature where you can infer the type of the schema. All we need to do is use the infer method. And now we can pass this type to the use form hook. For now, let's grab only the register function from the hook. We need to use this function on each input. To save time here, I'll go to our schema, hold command option and use the down arrow to make multiple cursors. Copy all field names, then holding option, I'll click to create one cursor on every input. Now we can use the register function on all input elements. And even though the field names are passed as a string here, it is a type safe string, which means that autocomplete works. And if we change the input name, the IDE will show us the error, so we know we need to change it in the register as well. Ok, with that we have our inputs connected to the form. Now let's set up the submit handler. For that, we will grab the handle submit function from the use form hook and set it inside the form's own submit. Here is where we would call the API to create the user account. To simulate the submit function, let's just log the values in the console. Now, since the button type is set to submit, if we press the button, it should trigger the submit handler. And there we have it. But there are still a few problems here. One of them is that if we try to submit without the name, nothing happens. 
and that's good because the user input is not valid. But we want to show the validation errors to the user. We don't want the user getting confused on why nothing is happening. So let's put the errors on the screen. First we will make a component for the error text. Let's make it small and let's make it red. Let's also put a little bit of padding above it. That should do it. Now we need to grab the errors from inside the form state in the use form hook. And then we can use the errors for our error text component for each field. Let's use that multi-cursor trick again. Let me select all the field names holding the option key, copy them, and then add the error text component for each field. We need a question mark here because the error can be undefined. Now if we try to submit again, we have the errors showing on the screen. Great! But there's one last problem I want to address here. If this was actually calling an API, it would have some latency. To simulate that, let's just make it an asynchronous function and wait 2 seconds before logging the values to the console. Now, if we press the button, it will take 2 seconds to log the result. And here's the problem, if we press it 3 times in a row, we will get the result 3 times. We don't want the user to be able to submit the form multiple times while the form is still submitting. To handle that, we can just grab the eSubmitting value from the form state in the user form hook and use it to set the button to disabled. Now if we press the button, it will turn to disabled until the submit function ends. And with that our form is complete. Now what if we want to turn this input into a custom component? So that we don't have these repeated styles on every input. Let's just create the text field component here and paste our original component. We don't need the register function. And you want this component to have the same parameters as the native input component. If we hover the native input tag, we can see the type of the attributes it has. Let's just copy it and put it into our own type. We also want our type to include the label and the optional error message. We don't actually want all of the attributes. We are already setting the class name inside the component. So let's use omit to remove the class name attribute from our type. Now we can set it as the type of the props for our custom component. We will take the label and the error attributes and leave the rest to be passed to the input. Now we can set the label here, the error here, and that's it. We have our component. Now let's try to use it. Well, that's not good. The thing is, React Hook Form uses the ref of the input component to be able to control it. But our component is not an input component. It is a component that contains an input component. So to fix that, we need to make sure that our component ref is the same as the input ref. To do that, React has a forward ref function. Let's just wrap our component inside the forward ref. And this is a generic function that takes two types. The first one is the type of the HTML element. And the second type is our component properties type. We can delete it from the inner function since we are already passing it here. Now, if you're using the default React ESLint rules, it's probably complaining that the inner function is a component without a name. To fix that, you could just add a comment to ignore the slint rule, or you could change the inner function to be a normal function with a name instead of an arrow function. Now if we save it, it works again, great! Now we can change all our inputs to our custom component. It is starting to look a lot better, right? Now what if you want to use a third-party component? Well, if the third-party component gives you an easy way to access the input reference, like the material UI package does, then we can just do the same thing we did with the forward ref. But some libraries don't offer that functionality. In that case, we need to use the controller component. For example, let's say we want the user to select the country as well. For that, let's install React Select. From what I've researched, there is no easy way to access the reference from the React Select component. So it will serve as a good example. But before setting the input, we need a list of all countries. So let's just Google it. JavaScript country list. All right, this will do it. Let's copy and paste it in our file and minimize it so that it doesn't take all the screen. Now let's make our select input. First we need to add the country to the schema. Then we will take the control from inside the use form hook. Now we can add our select input. The options should be a list of objects with a value and a label. But the country list we took from Google is one big object, where the keys are the values and the values are the labels. So we need to reshape this into the right format. Let's get all the entries from the object and map it into the shape we want. With that we already have our select input showing on the screen. We can even type to filter the options. But the value is not connected to the form yet. To do that, we'll need to wrap the input with the controller component from React Hook Form. We are passing the control we got from the user form here. Now we'll take the onChange handler from the controller and use it to update the input value. Now we finally have our input linked to the form. But writing all this controller boilerplate every time can get a little annoying. 
So let's make a more reusable component out of this. React Hook Form has a use controller hook to help with this. Let's start by creating our select field component. We will need the props for the use controller hook, which already has a type prepared for us in the React Hook Form package, but this type is a generic type that asks for the type of the form values. We could add the type of our form here, but then we would only be able to use this with this form here. We want to be able to use the select component in other forms as well, so we will make this a generic component. Our type needs to extend the field values type from the React Hook form, and now we can pass it here. That's it for the controller props. But we also want to be able to pass in the options for the select input. So let's use the end operator and add the options to the type. Ok, but to actually use it, we need to separate the options from the rest of the controller props. Now we can use the use controller hook and get the on change from inside of it. Now all we need to do is paste our original select input and replace the options with our parameter. That's it, we have a reusable, easy to use select component. Instead of having to wrap it up in the controller component every time, now we can just use it like this. I would say that that looks a lot better to work with than what we had before, don't you think? And yeah, this will be it for the tutorial, but there is a lot more this library can do. Things like watching the value changes, or programmatically setting the values, resetting the form to its default values, or even checking if there are any dirty fields so that you can pop up the user with that alert saying that he's leaving without saving his changes, and many other things you can do with it. So yeah, it is a very powerful and flexible library that I use in almost all my React projects. And yeah, I hope this video was helpful to you. This is me trying out a new format for my tutorial videos with more editing and trying to put more production quality into the video. It does take a lot longer to make the video, so to be honest, I'm not sure if it is really worth it. If you liked it and think it is worth it, please make sure to let me know by commenting and liking the video. And if you want to see more of my content, as always, don't forget to subscribe. See you in the next one. Jane.